The Epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus, Chapter 1 Occasion of the Epistle Since I see thee, the most excellent Diognetus, exceedingly desirous to learn the mode of worshipping God prevalent among the Christians, and inquiring very carefully and earnestly concerning them, what God they trust in, and what form of religion they observe, so as all to look down upon the world itself, and despise death, while they neither esteem those to be gods that are reckoned such as by the Greeks, nor hold to the superstition of the Jews, and what is the affection which they cherish among themselves, and why, in fine, this new kind of practice of piety has only now entered into the world, and not long ago. I cordially welcome this thy desire, and I implore God, who enables us both to speak and to hear, to grant to me to speak, that, above all, I may hear you have been edified, and to you so to hear, that I who speak may have no cause of regret for having done so. Chapter 2 Come, then, after you have freed yourself from all prejudices possessing your mind, and laid aside what you have been accustomed to, as something apt to deceive you, and being made, as if from the beginning, a new man, inasmuch as, according to your own confession, you are to be the hearer of a new system of doctrine, come and contemplate, not with your eyes only, but with your understanding, the substance and form of those whom ye declared and deemed to be gods. Is not one of them a stone similar to that on which we tread? Is not a second brass in no way superior to those vessels that are constructed for our ordinary use? Is not a third wood that is already rotten? Is not a fourth silver which needs a man to watch it lest it be stolen? Is not a fifth iron consumed by rust? Is not a sixth earthenware in no degree more valuable than that which is formed for the humblest purposes? Are not all these of corruptible matter? Are they not fabricated by means of iron and fire? Did not the sculptor fashion one of them? the brazier a second, the silversmith a third, and the potter a fourth? Was not every one of them, before they were formed by the arts of these workmen into the shape of these gods, each in its own way subject to change? Would not those things which are now vessels, formed of the same materials, become like to such, if they met with the same artificers? Might not these, which are now worshipped by you, again be made by men vessels similar to others? Are they not all deaf? Are they not all blind? Are they not without life? Are they not destitute of feeling? Are they not incapable of motion? Are they not all liable to rot? Are they not all corruptible? These things ye call gods, these ye serve, these ye worship, and ye become altogether like to them. For this reason ye hate the Christians, because they do not deem these to be gods. But do not ye yourselves, who now think and suppose such to be gods, much more cast contempt upon them than they, the Christians, do? Do ye not much more mock and insult them when ye worship those that are made of stone and earthenware, without appointing any persons to guard them? But those made of silver and gold ye shut up by night, and appoint watchers to look after them by day, lest they be stolen. And by those gifts which ye mean to present to them, do ye not, if they are possessed of sense, rather punish than honor them? But if, on the other hand, they are destitute of sense, ye convict them of this fact, while ye worship them with blood and the smoke of sacrifices. Let any one of you suffer such indignities. Let any one of you endure to have such things done to yourself. But not a single human being will, unless compelled to do it, endure such a treatment, since he is endowed with sense and reason. A stone, however, readily bears it, seeing it is insensible. Certainly you do not show by your conduct that your God is possessed of sense. And as to the fact that Christians are not accustomed to serve such gods, I might easily find many other things to say. But if even what has been said does not seem to any one sufficient, I deem it idle to say anything further. Chapter 3 And next, I imagine that you are most desirous of hearing something on this point, that the Christians do not observe the same forms of divine worship as do the Jews. The Jews, then, if they abstain from the kind of service above described, and deem it proper to worship one God as being Lord of all, are right. But if they offer him worship in a way which we have described, they greatly err. For while the Gentiles, by offering such things to those that are made destitute of sense and hearing, furnish an example of madness, they, on the other hand, are thinking to offer these things to God as if he needed them, might justly reckon it rather an act of folly than of divine worship. For he that made heaven and earth, and all that is therein, and gives to us all the things of which we stand in need, certainly requires none of those things which he himself bestows on such as think of furnishing them to him. But those who imagine that, by means of blood and the smoke of sacrifices and burnt offerings, they offer sacrifices acceptable to him, 
and that by such honors they show him respect, by supposing that they can give anything to him who stands in need of nothing, appear to me in no respect to differ from those who studiously confer the same honor on things destitute of sense, and which therefore are unable to enjoy such honors. Chapter 4 But as to their scrupulosity concerning meats, and their superstition as respect to the Sabbaths, and their boasting about circumcision, and their fancies about fasting and new moons, which are utterly ridiculous and unworthy of notice, I do not think that you require to learn anything from me, for to accept some of those things which have been formed by God for the use of men as properly formed, and to reject others as useless and redundant, how can this be lawful? And to speak falsely of God, as if he forbade us to do what is good on Sabbath days, how is not this impious? And to glory in the circumcision of the flesh as a proof of election, and as if on account of it they were specially loved by God, how is it not a subject of ridicule? And as to their observing months and days as if waiting upon the stars and the moon, and their distributing, according to their own tendencies, the appointments of God, and the vicissitudes of their seasons, some for festivities and others for mourning, who would deem this a part of divine worship, and not much rather a manifestation of folly? I suppose, then, you are sufficiently convinced that the Christians properly abstain from the vanity and error common to both Jews and Gentiles, and from the busybody spirit and vain boasting of the Jews. But you must not hope to learn the mystery of their peculiar mode of worshipping God from any mortal. Chapter 5 For the Christians are distinguished from other men neither by country, nor language, nor the customs which they observe. For they neither inhabit cities of their own, nor employ a peculiar form of speech nor lead a life which is marked out by any singularity. The course of conduct which they follow has not been devised by any speculation or deliberation of inquisitive men, nor do they, like some, proclaim themselves the advocates of any merely human doctrines, but, inhabiting Greek as well as barbarian cities, according as the lot of each of them has determined, and following the customs of the natives in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, they display to us their wonderful and confessedly striking method of life. They dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things with others, and yet endure all things as if foreigners. Every foreign land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as a land of strangers. They marry, as do all others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They are in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and are at the same time and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored, yet in their very dishonor are glorified. They are evil spoken of and yet are justified. They are reviled and blessed. They are insulted and repay the insult with honor. They do good, yet are punished as evildoers. When punished, they rejoice as if quickened into life. They are assailed by the Jews as foreigners, and they are persecuted by the Greeks. Yet those who hate them are unable to assign any reason for their hatred. Chapter 6 To sum up all in one word, what the soul is in the body, that are Christians in the world. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body, and Christians are scattered through all the cities of the world. The soul dwells in the body, yet is not of the body, and Christians dwell in the world, yet are not of the world. The invisible soul is guarded by the visible body, and Christians are known indeed to be in the world, but their godliness remains invisible. The flesh hates the soul and wars against it, though itself suffering no injury because it is prevented from enjoying pleasures. The world also hates the Christians, though in no wise injured, because they abjure pleasures. The soul loves the flesh that hates it, and loves also the members. Christians likewise love those that hate them. The soul is imprisoned in the body, yet preserves that very body. And Christians are confined in the world as in a prison, and yet they are the preservers of the world. The immortal soul dwells in a mortal tabernacle and Christians dwell as sojourners in corruptible bodies, looking for an incorruptible dwelling in the heavens. The soul, when but ill provided with food and drink, becomes better. In like manner, the Christians, though subjected day by day to punishment, increase the more in number. 
God has assigned to them this illustrious position, which it were unlawful for them to forsake. Chapter 7 For, as I said, this was no mere earthly invention which was delivered to them, nor is it a mere human system of opinion which they judge it right to preserve so carefully, nor has a dispensation of mere human mysteries been committed to them. But truly God himself, who is almighty, the creator of all things, and invisible, has sent from heaven and placed among men he who is the truth, and the holy and incomprehensible word, and has firmly established him in their hearts. He did not, as one might have imagined, send to men any servant or angel or ruler or any one of those who bear sway over earthly things, or one of those to whom the government of things in the heavens has been entrusted, but the very creator and fashioner of all things, by whom he made the heavens, by whom he enclosed the sea with its proper bounds, whose ordinances all the stars faithfully observe, from whom the sun has received the measure of his daily course to be observed, whom the moon obeys, being commanded to shine in the night, in whom the stars also obey, following the moon in her course, by whom all things have been arranged and placed within their proper limits, and to whom all are subject, the heavens and the things that are therein, the earth and the things that are therein, the sea and the things that are therein, fire, air, and the abyss, the things which are in the heights, the things which are in the depths, and the things which lie in between. This messenger he sent to them. Was it then, as one might conceive, for the purpose of exercising tyranny or of inspiring fear and terror? By no means, but under the influence of clemency and meekness. As a king sends his son, who is also a king, so sent he him, as God he sent him, as to men he sent him, as a savior he sent him, and as seeking to persuade not to compel us, for violence has no place in the character of God. As calling us, he sent him, not as vengefully pursuing us, as loving us, he sent him, not as judging us. For he will yet send him to judge us, and who shall endure his appearing? Do you not see them exposed to wild beasts, that they may be persuaded to deny the Lord, and yet not overcome? Do you not see that the more of them are punished, the greater becomes the number of the rest? This does not seem to be the work of man. This is the power of God. These are the evidences of his manifestation. Chapter 8 For who of men at all understood before his coming what God is? Do you accept of the vain and silly doctrines of those who are deemed trustworthy philosophers, of whom some said that fire was God, calling that God to which they themselves were by and by to come, and some water, and others some other of the elements formed by God? But if any one of these theories be worthy of approbation, every one of the rest of created things might also be declared to be God. But such declarations are simply the startling and erroneous utterances of deceivers, and no man has either seen him or made him known, but he has revealed himself, and he has manifested himself through faith, to which alone it is given to behold God. For God, the Lord and Fashioner of all things, who made all things, and assigned them their several positions, proved himself not merely a friend of mankind, but also long-suffering in his dealings with them. Yea, he always was of such a character, and still is, and will ever be, kind and good, and free from wrath, and true, and the only one who is absolutely good. And he formed in his mind a great and unspeakable conception, which he communicated to his son alone. As long then as he held and preserved his own wise counsel and concealment, he appeared to neglect us and to have no care over us. But after he revealed and laid open through his beloved son the things which had been prepared from the beginning, he conferred every blessing all at once upon us, so that we should both share in his benefits and see and be active in his service. Who of us would ever have expected these things? He was aware then of all things in his own mind, along with his son, according to the relation of subsisting between them. Chapter 9 As long then as the former time endured, he permitted us to be borne along by unruly impulses, being drawn away by the desire of pleasure and various lusts. This was not that he at all delighted in our sins, but that he simply endured them, nor that he approved the time of working iniquity which then was, but that he sought to form a mind conscious of righteousness, so that being convinced in that time of our unworthiness of attaining life through our own works, it should now, through the kindness of God, be vouchsafed to us. 
in having made it manifest that in ourselves we were unable to enter into the kingdom of God, we might through the power of God be made able. But when our wickedness had reached its height, and it had been clearly shown that its reward, punishment, and death was impending over us, and when the time had come which God had before appointed for manifesting his own kindness and power, how the one love of God, though exceeding regard for men, did not regard us with hatred, nor thrust us away, nor remember our iniquity against us, but showed great long suffering and bore with us. He himself took on him the burden of our iniquities. He gave his own Son as a ransom for us, the Holy One for transgressors, the blameless One for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? By what other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified than by the only Son of God? O sweet exchange! O unsearchable operation! O benefits surpassing all expectation! That the wickedness of many should be hidden a single righteous one, and that the righteousness of one should justify many transgressors. Having therefore convinced us in the former time that our nature was unable to attain life, and having now revealed the Savior who is able to save even those things which it was formerly impossible to save, by both these facts he desired to lead us to trust in his kindness, to esteem him as nourisher, father, teacher, counselor, healer, our wisdom, light, honor, glory, power, and life, so that we should not be anxious concerning clothing and food. Chapter 10 If you also desire to possess this faith, you likewise shall receive first of all the knowledge of the Father. For God has loved mankind, on whose account he made the world, to whom he rendered subject all things that are in it, to whom he gave reason and understanding, to whom alone he imparted the privilege of looking upwards to himself whom he formed after his own image, to whom he sent his only begotten Son, to whom he promised a kingdom in heaven, and will give it to those who have loved him. And when you have attained this knowledge, with what joy do you think you will be filled? Or, how will you love him who has first so loved you? And if you love him, you will be an imitator of his kindness. And do not wonder that a man may become an imitator of God. He can, if he is willing." For it is not by ruling over his neighbors, or by seeking to hold the supremacy over those that are weaker, or by being rich, and showing violence towards those that are inferior, that happiness is found. Nor can any one by these things become an imitator of God. But these things do not at all constitute his majesty. On the contrary, he who takes upon himself the burden of his neighbor, he who, in whatsoever respect he may be superior, is ready to benefit another who is deficient. He who, whatsoever things he has received from God, by distributing these to the needy, becomes a God to those who receive his benefits. He is an imitator of God. When thou shalt see, while still on earth, that God in the heavens rules over the universe, then thou shalt begin to speak the mysteries of God. Then shalt thou both love and admire those that suffer punishment because they will not deny God. Then shalt thou condemn the deceit and error of the world when thou shalt know what it is to live truly in heaven, when thou shalt despise that which is here esteemed to be death, when thou shalt fear what is truly death, which is reserved for those who shall be condemned to the eternal fire, which shall afflict those even to the end that are committed to it. Then shalt thou admire those who for righteousness' sake endure the fire that is but for a moment, and shalt count them happy when thou shalt know the nature of that fire. Chapter 11 I do not speak of things strange to me, nor do I aim at anything inconsistent with right reason. But having been a disciple of the apostles, I am become a teacher of the Gentiles. I minister the things delivered to me to those that are disciples worthy of the truth. For who that is rightly taught and begotten by the loving word would not seek to learn accurately the things which have been clearly shown by the word to his disciples, to whom the word being manifested was revealed to them, speaking plainly to them, not understood indeed by the unbelieving, but conversing with the disciples who, being esteemed faithful by him, acquired a foreknowledge of the mysteries of the Father. For which reason he sent the word, that he might be manifested to the world, and he, being despised by the people of the Jews, was, when preached by the apostles, believed on by the Gentiles." 
This is he who was from the beginning, who appeared as if new, and was found old, and yet who is ever born afresh in the hearts of the saints. This is he who, being from everlasting, is today called the Son, through whom the church is enriched in grace, widely spread, increases in the saints. Furnishing understanding, revealing mysteries, announcing times, rejoicing over the faithful, giving to those that seek, by whom the limits of faith are not broken through, nor the boundaries set by the fathers passed over. Then the fear of the law is chanted, and the grace of the prophets is known, and the faith of the gospels is established, and the tradition of the apostles is preserved, and the grace of the church exalts. Which grace, if you grieve not, you shall know those things which the word teaches, by whom he wills, and when he pleases. For whatever things we are moved to utter by the will of the word commanding us, we communicate to you with pains, and from a love of the things that have been revealed to us. Chapter 12 When you have read and carefully listened to these things, you shall know what God bestows on such as rightly love him, being made as ye are a paradise of delight, presenting in yourselves a tree bearing all kinds of produce and flourishing well, being adorned with various fruits. For in this place the tree of knowledge and the tree of life have been planted, but it is not the tree of knowledge that destroys. It is disobedience that proves destructive. Nor truly are those words without significance which are written, how God from the beginning planted the tree of life in the midst of paradise, revealing through knowledge the way to life. And when those who were first formed did not use this knowledge properly, they were, through fraud of the serpent, stripped naked. For neither can life exist without knowledge, nor is knowledge secure without life. Wherefore, both were planted close together. The apostle, perceiving the force of this conjunction, and blaming that knowledge which, without, doc- without true doctrine, is admitted to influence life, declares, Knowledge puffeth up, but love edifieth. For he who thinks he knows anything without true knowledge, and such as is witnessed to by life, knows nothing, but is deceived by the serpent, as not loving life. But he who combines knowledge with fear, and seeks after life, plants in hope, looking for fruit. Let your heart be your wisdom, and let your life be true knowledge inwardly received. Bearing this tree and displaying its fruit, thou shalt always gather in those things which are desired by God, which the serpent cannot reach, and to which deception does not approach. Nor is Eve then corrupted, but is trusted as a virgin, and salvation is manifested, and the apostles are filled with understanding, and the Passover of the Lord advances, and the choirs are gathered together, and are arranged in proper order, and the word rejoices in teaching the saints, by whom the Father is glorified, to whom be glory forever. Amen.